I'm going to share a word with you this morning. It's called purpose in your pain. It's not a word I really want to talk to you about, but I feel like the Lord laid it on my heart, especially over the last few days as I've been praying for you. I feel like God really has something to say to us this morning. Now, let me warn you, it's not fun. It's like getting your back waxed. There's some benefit in it, but it's agonising, they tell me. I've never done it, but uh, <laughs> just, to, just to elbow the person next to you, ask them if they have. <laughs> Purpose in your pain. Isn't it amazing about God that he never wastes a tragedy? And some of us need to know that because we're going through very difficult seasons and it's very easy to get our eyes on the difficulties of our circumstances. And this is not a glib cliche. This is something I want you to open your hearts and minds for a word from heaven this morning that speaks into your situation. Whatever you're going through, difficulty, pain, tragedy, loss, you don't have to come to church and pretend everything's fine. You do not have to come into this room and slap a smile on your dial, putting on your Sunday best and put on an act, happy, happy, joy, joy, like the little, little red engine, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. The truth is sometimes you just can't. But even when you can't, how many people know God can? God is always working purpose in our pain. And before we finish together this morning, I hope you and I can just stand and pray together and open up our hearts and embrace what we desperately need, a wave of God's grace to help us in the circumstances that we're in. Now, if you're not going through any pain at the moment, I speak for the rest of us when I say, we're incredibly jealous We want to knee you in the shins. Because some of us have stuff going on, don't we? If you don't have anything going on in your life, it's a really great opportunity for you to take a stand and say, I'm going to be there for someone who has something going on. But if you don't have anything on, still listen to the message because it's, you know, just around the corner, I'm afraid. That's not a prophecy, just a statement of reality. Life is full of tragedy. It is. It's full of pain. Oh, unexpected stuff pops up all the time. And I want you to know this morning that God sees you. He's full of love, he's full of compassion, he's full of grace, and he will never waste the tragedies that you're going through. And hopefully we'll have our eyes opened a little bit more to know God's timing and his methods and his purpose in our lives this morning. Something that really opened my eyes to the fact that God works purpose in our pain was the story of Linny. Linny had been diagnosed with an aggressive, debilitating, degenerative disorder. Before too long, she wasn't able to drive. Before too long, she could barely see. Before too long, she needs a walker to get around. Before too long, she needs to live in 24-7 assisted living because she falls over and can't get herself back up off the ground. She was quite young, quite a, quite a thriving, energetic person, and all of a sudden, in a very short amount of time, every KPI of her health just began to decline. She had to go into an assisted living nursing home and as she was in there and reflecting, everybody would say the same thing. Man, for a lady going through a lot of stuff, she sure is full of hope. It's suspicious. She's full of hope. She had the idea, you know, I'm in this home, I'm in this nursing facility, I'm in this assisted living 24-7, but I'm younger than everybody. She had this idea, you know, all these people, their mobility's challenged, they can't get around. If they get around, they need a carer, therefore they can't always get out to do what they want. And she had this idea, imagine if God brought me here to share his word in their lives. And she went to the facility and she said, hey, could I borrow the chapel every Sunday? And just like every Sunday morning at around 10 a.m., you know, that's early for some folks, um, at around 10 a.m., could, could, could I host a gathering and just like some worship and some prayer and just share God's word with people? And you know, from the very first Sunday to this, they packed that chapel out in that nursing home. As people come, some of them for the first time in their lives responding to the gospel, as a shaky old lady in a walker who can barely see or read, who has had to buy herself a Bluetooth speaker so she can play Amazing Grace from her iPhone. And week after week, people come and they hear the word of God. And some of them, they, you know, they're elderly and they, 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 they knew of God's word when they were younger, but it's been a long time since they've thought about God or walked with God. But now they sit and they weep their way through the services and they sing hymns and they respond to God's word together. Linny's my mum. And we've watched her over the last number of years. Take her eyes off the horrible 
horrible decline in her health. The, the, the undignified decline in her abilities to do very simple things that we like to do for ourselves that we just take for granted. But you know the one thing that she's never done? She's never taken her eyes off the hope in the gospel. And it's almost like she hasn't looked at her pain, she's looked through her pain and said, what is the hope that's on the other side of this? And the best that she could come up with is, could God use my pain for his purposes? Isn't that a challenging thought? Here's the surprise that we found through her disability. God is working purpose in her pain. God is working destiny in her destruction. God is turning her battle scars into her battle stripes. He's making a message out of her mess and he's turning her test into a testimony. And I wonder if we could ask ourselves that same question today, no matter what we're faced with, or perhaps install this idea as antivirus software on our hearts. Could it be, friends? Could it be? Could we approach our lives with a different imagination? And here's the imagination. Could I imagine that God is working purpose in my pain? Even though I can't see what it is, God is working purpose in it. What he did not say is God is working your pain. God, God, God's making this happen. God's decided to do something to you to play mind games with you. God's using you as a pawn on his chest. Well, I didn't say that. God is not the author of evil. But I tell you what, the longer you work with God, the more you realise He is the redeemer of it. He's the redeemer of it. He would take what is horrible, take what is tragic, He'll take what is unimaginably painful and gut-wrenching, but He will, will turn it around and you'll, you'll step back and say, how did, how did that tragedy become a tapestry? And suddenly we look back over years and we see all of the highlights of our pain and, and, and all of our tragedy. How God has the ability in the long haul to turn something that's painful and make it deeply purposeful. Never makes it better. Never makes you go, well, I'm glad that happened. You're not Pollyanna. But what he definitely does, although he doesn't author evil, he constantly redeems it. Who could say amen? Yeah. Could I imagine God's working purpose in my pain? Could I imagine that God has a destiny that could come out of the destruction in my life? Could I imagine that these battle scars I'm bearing could be healed and transformed into battle stripes and make me a general in God's army? Could I imagine that God can take the mess I currently find myself and build it into a message? Could God take this testing season I'm in and, 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 and wield it into a testimony? Well, this idea, I know if you're going through something difficult, probably just seems glib and, and a cliche. And the intention of this is not to minimise your suffering. The truth is it doesn't make it less painful just because there's purpose. And that's some, what some of us have to embrace. It doesn't make it less gut-wrenching. It doesn't make it less alienating. But it makes it less wasteful. If we imagine that God never wastes a tragedy. And his intention will be that if you'll just keep reading to the end of the book, if you just keep per persevering to the next scene of the play of your life, they, they, you, 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 you'll see he is the God of the turnaround, isn't he? Yeah. It's a core promise in scripture. In what I would consider to be one of the best known but least understood passages in scripture. Probably we all know it but probably many of us misunderstand it. And that, of course, is found in the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the church in Rome, in the eighth chapter, verses 28 and 30. That's Romans 8, verse 28 to 30. Listen to what it says. I think we've got it to put up on the screen. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren. Even if you're a woman in the place, just, you know, elbow the women next to you. That includes you, sistren, as well. Moreover, whom he predestined, those he also called, whom he called, he justified, whom he justified, these he also glorified. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God. What Paul is saying is God is working purpose in our pain, friends. 
no matter what we're going through, that God can take that and he can work it ultimately into something beautiful and good at the end of the day. Yeah. Even in the midst of the pain, his working purpose. This really hit home to me recently when I was standing in a worship service and a lone voice who could not sing in a moment of silence raised their voice and begun to sing I'm no longer a slave to fear. You know the song? Yeah. I'm no longer a slave to fear. It's even worse than my voice, this guy singing. <laughs> I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. And he just belted it out in this moment of silence. Everyone else was silent. And this guy just gave it everything he's got. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. And everybody was moved. Because of course the person singing was our friend Peacock. Peacock is a man in his mid-50s. He has piercings everywhere, all over his face, bolts through every bits of his body. He's happy to show you them all. It's a bit awkward if he does. <laughs> he has a shaved head except for a tuft of hair right in the very front, which he has dyed pink and purple. And he puts it up in a ponytail with several bands so it stands straight up and then flays out at the top. <laughs> Giving him the name, Peacock. He's been doing it for 20 years. <laughs> I met Peacock at a men's camp, the weirdest men's camp you've ever been on. These guys in South Australia, farmers and truckers, they just advertise throughout the whole region, blokes camp out. And there's no fancy stuff. They get three portaloos and they put them in the middle of a hay field that's just been mowed. They put up a tent where we can all get together for coffee, tea, and what will be the preaching of God's word, prayer and worship. But the half the town doesn't know that's what's actually gonna happen. They just think they're getting invited to go to a bloke's camp out. It's very interesting. And I was invited to be the guest speaker and I got the trophy of being the only speaker in history that actually slept in a swag in a field under their truck with the rest of the guys instead of, you know, sleep back in town. And we'd all get together and we'd put our swags out and we'd sleep out and then we'd, we'd uh, get, go into the, the big tent for uh, time of worship and the preaching of the gospel and prayer. And what was really interesting was how many people had never sat through worship or stood through worship or even uh, participated in public devotion of any kind or worship and they just kind of stand there looking around like a cow, looking at a new gate, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and Peacock was one of those guys. He'd been invited by a friend. And I remember because he'd sat fairly close to the front. And you know, you've got to think about this. This is the bush in South Australia, mate. You know how many people have bolts through all of their face and multicolored hair in South Australia in the country? One. <laughs> Peacock. And you could see these Aussie farmers strolling in going, hey, my giddy aunt, what have what, what I got here? <laughs> And Peacock was sitting right up the front, but he was on his edge as the gospel began to preach. He moved forward on his seat and he was just staring. The first couple of sessions, he just listened in the coffee break of one of the sessions. He came up to me and I was having chats with lots of these people and we were discussing the content of the gospel and some of the sermon material that had just been preached. And Peacock come, came up to me and, and he puts his hand on my shoulder like this, is a bit shorter than me. And he goes, well, I guess I'm going to have to bring you down to earth since everyone's telling you how good you are. <laughs> and he's wearing purple Crocs. <laughs> and I'm wearing these shoes, actually. R.M. Williams boots, the uniform of the country pastor. <laughs> and he gets his Croc and he goes, <laughs> and scrubs it into my foot. I'm gonna dirty your shoes a little bit so you don't get too big for your boots. <laughs> now, I'm not gonna lie, I just thought about elbowing him in the face just for just a small second, but I didn't do it, and you should be proud of your friend, Ben. <laughs> I said, don't, don't do that, mate, don't do that. And I put my arm around him. I said, look, if you want attention, we can just have a chat. You don't need to do something about that. And actually, that just caused something in him to switch and he opened up about his story. He had an incredible history of trauma and pain and rejection, abuse, horrendous abuse from a young kid. Started when he was four years old. By the time I met him, he's in his mid-50s and he still remembers everything. 
And in some way, for poor old Peacock, it's like he was emotionally stuck at that very moment. He was like a, 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 a small boy in a man's body and his dress and his mannerisms and his way of acting out and his multicoloured Paris Hilton hair and his, it was just, you know, everything was just a quest for him to get attention and I'm not saying it judgmentally, but you know, isn't it true? Everybody's weird stuff makes sense if you know their story eventually. I'm not saying it's okay, but it's just like, man, if you really know what someone's gone through, then suddenly lots of stuff about them begins to make sense. And we began to talk and he was asking, well, do you, th do you think God would accept even me? And we began to have a conversation about that. And I went easy on him the first discussion because we don't know each other well and he also just messed up my shoes. I'm not getting you into heaven, peacock. <laughs> A couple of days go by, it was a long camp. Different fellows from the ministry team began to talk with him and pray for him. And I can remember the moment where we made an offer of invitation to people. If you would like to draw a line in the sand of your life and say, God of the universe, no matter where I'm going to, no matter where I'm coming from, my answer is yes to Jesus' offer of life. I'm crossing over that line and I'm gonna be a follower of yours now, God. And we know God just hovers over our lives in the preaching of the gospel and he gives us this inner wherewithal. Yes, come on, welcome home, son. And he was the first person. And I just said, just put your hand up like that and we'll just pray for you. And he put his hand up, but he also stood up like this. And we prayed and tears streamed down my face as we prayed Peacock into the kingdom of God. The next morning we had a communion service and in that moment of silence, Peacock standing in the second row, raises his horrible singing voice. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. He only knew those two lines, so he just sang them for quite a bit. <laughs> and there was this hush over the crowd as just these Aussie blokes and farmers, because everyone knew him, he was a flamboyant character going all around the camp. And as he stood there with tears streaming down his face, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child, I am a child, I am a child of God. There was not a dry eye in the place. As we bore corporate witness to a man who has been reborn into a new creation life. He comes out to take the microphone off someone who was leading that moment of the service. <laughs> I spoke into my collar. Sniper, get ready, G12, G12. <laughs> shoot to kill, shoot to kill. He gets the microphone and he, and he says, I've asked my friend, if I could have your permission, I've asked my friend to do something. And a guy comes out and he's holding a great big silver pair of scissors. And Peacock says, God has spoken to me and told me that everything about my identity is a constructed lie that I invented to cope with the horrible pain of my past. But I'm no longer a slave to fear. But I am a child of God. And God has spoken to me and told me that I've got to shed everything I've constructed in my false identity. And right there on the spot, he took out all of his studs and piercings. You know, if you've got studs and piercings, I'm not saying you have to do that, but you understand for him, it was a powerful, incredible moment. As he takes all the bolts out of his gum and his chin and everything out of his nose. And I'm thinking, man, the air travel's gonna be so much easier for you from now on. <laughs> then he gets his friend to come out with the scissors and they have a ceremonial cutting of his pigtail off. A pigtail that he's had dyed pink and purple for 30 years because he's no longer a slave to fear, but he's a child of God. Throughout that camp, I had sat with pigtail, leaning up against, my well, stood actually, leaning up against, sorry, peacock. <laughs> I don't know why I said that, it fits. Um, I, I had stood with him chatting, leaning up against my Hilux, making coffee. He was very interested in my hand grinder and my AeroPress coffee maker, which you have to bring when you go camping. Life's too short for good coffee, friends. You don't want that Nescafe Blend 43 stuff, you know? Took them 43 goes to get it right. And on the 43rd time, they said, let's just go to jail, sweep all the ground hatred off the floor and put it in a jar, and that's what you can drink. That's what it is. So I therefore prefer to grind up my own stuff and use it in my AeroPress instead. 
He was very interested, so we'd sit there grinding coffee and drinking coffee, and I'd just tell him my story, tell him about my trauma, tell him about how the revelation of Jesus completely changed my life. And the day when I saw him get his pigtail cut off, I remember thinking, God, this is it, isn't it? This is the moment I realise that you truly, for 20 years, have taken all my pain, all my trauma, all my shame, and you've worked it into something good. And I had this existential moment, almost like where the camera zoomed right out, and I just reflected on my entire life history, all my addictions, my shame, abuses, trauma, the horrible gut-wrenching pain, the night after night after night of crying myself to sleep or not getting to sleep or having an anxiety attack or drinking myself to sleep. And the years of God walking with me and transforming my life and forgiving me and healing me and restoring me and none of that healing has taken away the gut-wrenching pain of the experience. But now at this end of it, I realise if I hadn't had that entire journey, it would have never brought me to be standing in this hayfield leaning against my truck talking to Peacock who could get the revelation I'm no longer a slave to fear I'm a child of God it's like God worked purpose in all my pain turned my destruction into destiny and I realised God doesn't waste anything does he he doesn't waste what you've been through but he's also not just devoted to keeping me happy It's sad. God has been managing the universe for a long time. He refuses to take my advice on all things to do with universe management. It's like I'm often making great recommendations. Lord, you know, I wouldn't do it that way. I'd probably do it this way. Have you thought about it? You know, people say I've got a unique take on the world. Lord, this might help you out. Um, God isn't devoted to making me happy, but he is devoted to taking what's difficult and working it into a tapestry of his goodness. We don't always see it. We don't always like it. And we have to understand, God isn't torturing us to make it happen. God's doing something really horrible to you just because he's got a good plan to, he's not a psychopathic narcissist in the sky. But he won't waste what you've gone through. We live in a fallen world where evil is rampant and the evil is even in us, man. But God won't waste it. The scripture says that God works all things for good. There's a misconception about this verse because we think that that good that God is working is only about us. The NIV is the translation I normally read from. We'll put it up on the screen. It actually says it this way. We know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And it's kind of given us this idea that while my expectation in God is any time I go through something difficult, that, 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 that God is, is going um, he, he, that, that to make it good for me, that, that it's going to work out the way I want it to. It's for my good, for my good, for me, good, for me, my and me, me, my, me and mine. And it actually sets us up for a false expectation because we begin to look to God as though God exists just to make me happy when I experience mess. And many of us are disappointed and frustrated because that false belief, that illusion, the cold, hard reality of life has now made us disillusioned. Because he's not devoted to just making your situation good for you all the time. The promise of scripture, and it's a bitter pill to swallow, and I'm sorry I have to be the one as a pastor to tell it to you. The promise of scripture is not, it's gonna work out good for you. The NIV translates, he works all things for the good of those who love him. It's not what it says. In the original Greek, I think we've got a slide that will say that. We know that in all things, we know that to those loving God, God works all things together for good. For good. God is working good that transcends you that transcends your taste, that transcends your desires, that transcends your situation. He's working good. And and see, there's a difference between me saying, God's doing what's good for me versus, no, no, God's working something for good. And what he's always trying to do is objective good, good in the universe, good that's his mission. He has a greater good, he has a greater good that, that involves what God wants to do to sweep others up into his plan and his beautiful rule and reign and his justice. 
And sometimes we just need a friendly reminder in our suffering that it's not just that God's gonna do something good for you or God's gonna do it good for me, that means all my things are gonna work out fine. I can't promise you everything's gonna work out fine for you, friend. I can't, I wish I could. You can turn on the television any day of the week and see someone with a Texas accent promising you if you send enough checks to a ministry then everything's gonna turn out fine in your world. Can I tell you something? That ain't biblical. The truth of the matter is, you might experience difficulty. This is so joyous. Who's glad they came into church this morning? You might experience tragedy or difficulty. And it might not end up with a fairy tale ending. But it could be redeemed. It could be used by God to unfurl his purposes in the earth. For good, not just our good. Sometimes when we're in a place of difficulty, we have to understand, okay, God, the ultimate trust here is I do not know how this is gonna work out. And I'm believing to see your goodness in the land of the living, but I also understand that what is good might not be something that equates to my tastes and preferences. But now I lean into you and trust God. You're gonna make something good. You're gonna make something beautiful out of this mess. You're gonna use it for your purposes. You're gonna use it to show me your face. You're gonna use it to show me your glory. You're gonna use it to sweep other people into the kingdom. God, redeem my story and use it. That's the prayer of someone who understands the God who makes tapestries out of tragedies. So often we equate our own plan for our own good, but God has a higher way called the greater good and we cannot always see it, we're blinded. You ever seen little kids having a tantrum in the shopping centre? My oldest daughter, India, when she was two, she had her first and last tantrum in the shopping centre. She grabbed a pair, a packet of eucalyptus lollies off the bottom shelf and she fell in love with those lollies. Like no child has ever loved anything before and she wanted them. Now what I knew that she didn't know, because I can read, is she hates eucalyptus. We've given her eucalyptus before and it took us three hours to calm down. We had to do deliverance, get an exorcist, get a dog trainer, get the super nanny, fire hydrant. She hates eucalyptus. But she's dumb, she can't read, she's two. So she grabs these eucalyptus lollies because she thought she knew what they were, even though she didn't realise that's not going to be good for you, kid. And she wanted those eucalyptus lollies. And I said, India, put them back. And she lay on the ground and did the full snow angel tantrum on the floor in our nation's greatest chain of supermarkets, embarrassing me publicly. This silly girl having a tantrum because she wanted lollies that I knew wouldn't be good for her, but she was too dumb to know it. (laughs) And this has nothing to do with my sermon, but I bent down and I said, if you don't get up and stop this tantrum and put those lollies back, we're gonna go out to the car and I'm gonna fix you, kid. (laughs) And I said it so quietly. How many parents know? Yelling doesn't work with kids. It's scarier the quieter you talk. (laughs) She stopped the tantrum, she looked at me and she stood up and she handed me the lollies, I put them back and then we walked off hand in hand and everyone in the supermarket was like, teach us your ways. How many times in life have we been like India where we have a bit of a tanty because we think we want something? But can I tell you something? The longer you walk with God, the more you realise he is old and he is wise. And he knows the end from the beginning. And we go through difficulties or inconveniences or downright tragedy and everything in between. And we think we know, but how many of us know, especially if you're over 50 in the room, just give me a wave of testimony. Or, you know, if you haven't got enough energy, give me a pinky wave of testimony. It's okay. If you're over 50, how many times can you look back and you can say, man, I thought I knew what was good for me then. And I thought I knew what I wanted. And thank God he didn't give me what I wanted. Yeah. There's an alarming absence of testimonial hands raised right now. You don't want to admit you're over 50, do you? Because you're dyeing your beard. When Jesus sees Zacchaeus up the tree, do you remember the story in Luke chapter 19? Zacchaeus, the tax collector, has run ahead of the crowd. He's gone up a tree because he can't see Jesus. And Jesus gets to the bottom of the tree and looks up at the tree and says, Zacchaeus, come down. 
Only he doesn't call him Zacchaeus. No English translation brings this out because it's very weird and it bears some explanation that's just beyond what a translator is capable of doing in the moment. When Jesus calls Zacchaeus out of the tree, he doesn't say, Zacchaeus, come out of the tree. He abbreviates his name in the original Greek that Luke wrote his original gospel in. The Greek word for Zacchaeus is not Zacchaeus like it is in the rest of the story. In this moment, Jesus changes his name. Jesus says, Zacchae, come down. Weird. And if you do a study on the Greek word Zacchae, you find out there's only one character called Zacchae in the rest of Scripture, and he's only mentioned twice, two obscure references, one in the book of Nehemiah and one in the book of Ezra. And Zacchae is a, a Jewish patriarch whose family was taken off into captivity in Babylon, but under Ezra and Nehemiah, when they came back to rebuild the temple and to rebuild the city of Jerusalem, one guy brings 160 of his relatives back out of captivity. And his name is Zakai. Isn't it interesting? When Jesus sees an evil public enemy number one tax collector up a tree that everybody else rejects and pushes away, he doesn't see a Zacchaeus, a tiny little bright shiny one. He sees a Zakai, a guy who needs to be beckoned out of exile so he can rebuild and bring a bunch of people with him on the way. That's called redeeming your story. You know how I know that? I know that because from 10 years old onwards, I had debilitating illnesses. I didn't do what normal kids did, didn't play sport, had chronic asthma, had a liver and kidney disorder that would shut down, had deep depression, deep trauma, had social anxiety, couldn't look people in the eye, barely left the house, would spend entire terms of school bedridden, sleeping. And because of that, everyone in my family knew, what are we gonna do with the weird little bubble boy? And they would just give me books. And one of my great, great uncles, an old man that I'd never met, passed away, but he had a huge library. And on that library, there were two textbooks that for some reason, one of our relatives thought, little Benny might want that. And at 10 years old, they passed on to me a Greek textbook and a Hebrew textbook. And I was just running out of everything else to read, man. Tried my sister's Cosmopolitan, but you know, I just didn't want foils in my hair, so. I read this Hebrew textbook and this Greek textbook. And I learnt, don't know why, to read ancient Hebrew and ancient Greek from between about 10 and about 14. Because I didn't have nothing else to do. Time went on, my health changed, it had a long arc of recovery. I came to faith, that caused me to just have massive healing and, and changes in my life. And finally I discerned the call of God in my life and I went and sat in Bible college and I sat through my first New Testament Greek class. And I went, I've seen this before. I've seen this before. Everyone else in my New Testament Greek class that year had a nervous breakdown learning the Greek language. <laughs> and I swan through, baby. Because <laughs> for more than 15 years, Little Benny the Bubble Boy had been lying in bed. I'm not really smoking. Uh, would, would, uh, little Benny the Bubble Boy had been lying in bed when he was sick and, and, and in tragedy and alone learning New Testament Greek. Do you know that year how I paid for my college fees? The college asked me to take on an employed position as a tutor because all the other loser students were really struggling learning a foreign Greek ancient language when they were there. So like, what is wrong with you guys? Get with the program. I've been doing this since I was 10. <laughs> And, and, and ever since then, I've always found incredible delight and revelation, but not only that, I've had so much opportunity to teach in Bible college or preach in churches or pastor in churches and open God's word and look back at an original language that I learnt when I was a traumatised, depressed 10-year-old. It's just like God worked purpose in my pain. It's like God turned my destruction into destiny that has literally become my source of employee because really I don't have any other skill but opening God's word and chatting a bit about it. Usually too long, don't worry, not three hours, today. He took my battle scars and turned them into my battle stripes. It doesn't diminish the pain, but it shows me something when I look back over every twist and turn and corner of my story, I can now look back and say, God, you haven't wasted a thing. 
My very first taste of Christian ministry was when Danielle and I had the revelation at a missions conference, the pastor at the missions conference preached and he said, the biggest difficulty that you've been through, if you will put it in God's hand, will become the best testimony if you let God redeem it and you can help everybody else wrestling through that. So to try to work out what do you want me to do, God? How do you want me to respond? Where do you want me to go? What are you calling me to do? All you do is you take your mess and you place it in God's hand. You say, God, could you please transform this into a message? And I thought that just sounds easy enough for someone like me, recovering drug addict, recovering alcoholic to deal with. And so I went home and in about three days, I wrote a very short book, not a good book, one I'm still not too proud of, but I was proud of it back then. I was done. The book was called Depression in 3D. That book contained three observations, three observations about what I discovered after coming to Jesus about how to walk out of depression. Very simple ones, just three. And I wrote that book. And then I decided that at our local library in Logan City in Queensland, that I would have a seminar for anyone struggling with depression and anyone who was feeling depressed or lost in depression, that, that I would give you a free copy of my book and that I would share with you for 45 minutes my three insights and give you the book to take away of how you could also just learn three things to help you journey out of the spiral of depression. And we thought, you know what? If 10, 10 or 11 people came, we'd be thrilled to just pass on. Because the last one, the last D was, was do discover meaning and purpose. And that was the bit where I would talk about having discovered the creator of the universe and destiny and faith and share my testimony about Jesus after warming them up with the other very helpful practical observations as well. So I don't know where I got the idea from, but I wrote to every newspaper and every radio station and every counsellor, emails to schools, and said, this is what I'm doing. I used Microsoft Publisher to make a click art poster. <laughs> cutting edge clip art. And I sent it around and stuck it up everywhere. I got calls from radio stations and I went on the radio to talk about how Jesus had transformed the darkness of my depression. And I had a journalist from the Courier Mail do a second page story on me. And I had the local Albert and Logan News. I mean, I'm a big deal, guys. The Albert and Logan News. <laughs> they did a front page story and the headline on the front page story with my ugly mug right on the front said, battling the demons within. We've still got the article. And by the time we turned up to the library that day, there was 55 people waiting 20 minutes before it was even supposed to start. And we went in there and we journeyed with them and cried with them and laughed with them and talked with them and we maintained connection with all of those people, many of whom came to faith, but one lady, her name was Sue. She came and found me at my office one day because we'd shared our information. And she grabbed me and I didn't even recognise that I'd known her from the seminar. And as I'm walking through, she grabbed my sleeve and she goes, Ben, Ben, I've just got to tell you, I've got to tell you. An elderly lady, I just want to thank you for doing that seminar. I want to thank you for sharing your testimony. Jesus has transformed my life. Jesus has made himself real to me and I am now a daughter of the King. Thank you, thank you, thank you. She had no history with faith. She'd never been to church in her life. She was in her 70s. It just so happened that we invited her. Well, do you have a church? No, I've never been to a church. Don't even know. Well, come to ours. She began to come to our church for three months. And three months and one day later, she didn't get out of bed that morning because she passed away peacefully in her sleep. But Sue had three months, no longer a slave to fear, but a daughter of the king. It just sounded like God took my destruction and turned it into destiny. Our church said, oh, we thought you were just a weird guy, but this actually might have something to it. So we went to the north of Brisbane and we ran the same seminar in a high school. We got 150 people to that seminar. They were much better at organising and promotion than I was on my own. Gave everybody a free copy of the book. Said to everybody, we're going to run a 10-week course with Ben, which became a Care Force Life Keys course to search for significance. And about 100 people signed up for that course. We went on to plant a campus out of that very experience. That today is a church campus of 500 people. Because... God will work purpose in your pain.
But Paul says, for those who love God. It's a Greek present active participle. I know that, I learned it when I was 10. Just means this. If you had to translate it faithfully, it doesn't make sense in English, not grammatically correct in English. For, for those who are currently loving God. God, we know that in all things, God works together for good to those who are currently loving God. And there's this sense in that scripture, come on, surrender your life to God right now in this now moment. Hand everything over to him. Love him now. Don't wait to love him till it gets good. Don't don't wait to love him till the storm passes. Just begin to love on God now because he's the one that works all things together for good. He will not waste your wrestle. He's not the author of it, but he is the redeemer of it. Can I pray for you before I hand back to the team this morning? Why don't we bow our heads all over this room, hey? I must apologise if you came to church this morning hoping just for me to give you something happy, clappy and funny and, you know, pat ya. But over the last three days, I've wrestled in prayer for you and I know Jesus is hovering over this room and I'll tell you what he wants to say, friend. He just wants to encourage you and love you and whisper to your soul, come on, there's purpose in your pain. Come on, there's destiny in your destruction. Come on, there's a testimony in this test. Just persevere, hang on, lean into God. I know it hurts. I know it's dark. I know it's hopeless. I know it's discouraging, but you know, just hang on, hang on. Even if you're only just with your fingertips gripping the hem of his garment, it's okay. Keep pushing through the crowd, brother. Keep pushing through the crowd, sister. God's working purpose in your pain. God can make a tapestry out of your tragedy. I pray for you in Jesus' name. I pray you'd have the grace to open your heart and mind to the Word of God. I pray the Holy Spirit would hover over your life right now in Jesus' name and that every breaking heart, every aching heart, every confusion, mind, everyone with a wrestle, everyone with grief, everyone wrestling with loss, I pray the comfort of the Holy Spirit would come alongside you, friend. I pray God would move in your heart. I pray the comfort and and then the kindness of the King would just hover over you that right now in this place, as you breathe the very air itself, that you would sit there and go, God, at least I know you're with me. God, even though I'm suffering, I'm not a slave to fear. I'm your child. God, you're working purpose in my pain. You're going to work this into something good. There's a purpose for it. There's a destiny for it. There's a message for it. God, you can make a ministry out of my mess. God, I, I surrender to you. And even in the pain, I'm not living in denial of it. I fully acknowledge it. But now, Lord, I, I, I hand it over to you. I pray for you, friend. I pray you could say yes and amen to that prayer. God, I hand it over to you. I pray for you, friend. I pray right now, God, would just begin supercharging your heart with faith to trust him in this storm. Faith to hold on to him in this storm. Faith to look not at your issues, but through them and go, hey God, what do you got on the other side for this? Maybe for some of us, that's God's word this morning. Begin to hope again. Begin to trust again. Begin to breathe again. I know it's difficult, but hey, just take a deep breath right now and say, God, I'm embracing the hope in your word. You can do something. You can work it for good. You can redeem it. You can heal. You can turn around. You're the God of the turnaround. You're the but God, God. Pray for you, friend. Pray the comfort of the Holy Spirit would hover over your life that if nothing else, you would know God is with you. I pray for you in Jesus' name. I'm going to pray for one more group of people, friends. People in a room like this, I know God is hovering. And the truth is some of us today, for the first time ever, or for the first time in way too long, we also need to do that thing that I've mentioned, change my life, change Peacock's life. Well, we need to say, God, no matter where I've been going to, no matter where I've been coming from, Today, I'm turning around. I am drawing a line in the sand of my life. I'm crossing over. I'm following you. My answer is yes to the life Jesus offers me. And before I close today, I want to pray for these two groups of people. Number one, those who know that God is going, that's you. Come on, that's you. Let's put up our spiritual antenna in this place right now and you'll know it. Men and women in this room, hearing the welcome home of God for the first time ever. Or maybe you did it once, but you haven't been walking with God. But you know today, he's saying, come on, that's you too. Come back home. That's the second group. Those who need to, for the first time in way too long, say, yep, God, I'm drawing that line in the sand of my life. And I'm saying yes to the gospel. First time ever, or for the first time in way too long. 
You know, family, if we all put our spiritual antenna up in this place, we'll know that God is hovering over every heart, every mind, every life. And some of us will be sensing that warm grace, that welcome home, that, that grace of God to hover over our lives and give us the wherewithal to actually say yes to turn our lives over to Him. God, no matter where I'm going to, God, no matter where I've been coming from, I turn my life over to You. I draw a line in the sand of my life. I cross over it. Now, Jesus, I'm going to be a follower of Yours. God, make me Your child. And here's the thing. It's not something you do. It's something He gives you grace to do. And in a room like this, I know right now the Holy Spirit's here. Jesus is here. Been here all morning as we've worshipped and prayed. And now He's saying, come on, that's you. Son, that's you, my son. That's you, my daughter. Come on, say yes. Turn your life over to me. Turn around. Come and be my follower. Say yes. First time ever. First time in a long time. Welcome home, my child. And before I hand back to the team, I want to include you in a prayer. If you know that's you, and here's what I want you to do. I just want you to raise one hand up to heaven. It's not magic. It's just symbolic. Hey, God, that's me. But it's also a symbol that I know who am I praying for. I'm going to leave you in your seat, but I want to say a prayer. If that's you and you'd like to be included in this prayer this morning, just go ahead and shoot one hand up to heaven right now. Good on you. Good on you. Ah, oh, good on you. Good on you, guys. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Who else in this room? Just want to make sure I don't miss anyone. Good on you, my friends. Ah, oh, good on you. Well done. Well done. Isn't it awesome, God, calling people back to himself, welcoming them home. Just want to make sure I don't miss anyone. If you're in the tiered seating area, just shoot your hand up nice and high so I can see it, so I know who I'm praying for. Good on you, my friends. Good on you. People all over this room just reconnecting with God this morning or connecting for the first time. Well, God bless you. Let me pray. If you're one of those folks that raised your hand, good on you. I can see that, guys. That's awesome. That's awesome. Good on you. If you're one of those folks that raised your hand, just go ahead and put a hand on your heart. It's not magic. It's symbolic. You know what it is? Fresh start today. Fresh start today. New future. New destiny. New page. The first day of the rest of your life. Welcome home. Let me pray for you, friend. Those of you with your hands on your hearts. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters in this place this morning. Thank you for your divine hospitality. Thank you for your welcome into the kingdom. Thank you that you're calling people right now everywhere to, to turn around, to turn after you, to get on the Jesus way, to become a follower of God. And it's not something they just do, but it's actually something you're calling them. You're giving grace and you're welcoming them and you're turning lives around today, Lord, to turn them after you. And I thank you, Father, right now wherever they are, wherever they're sitting in, whatever mess they've been going through, you're making a message, you're making a testimony, you're making a tapestry, and I thank you for it. And I declare over them today, God, no longer a slave to fear, but now a child of God. Bless them, Father. Let them know you're with them. Lord, let them know you're working in their hearts, in their minds, in their situations. Lord, let them know that you are with them. Hover over their lives. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.